Okay, so with that, I'd like to introduce you. Uh, Dr. Graham Wiley is the CEO of the Medical Research Network, MRN. And um, I'm going to let you take it away. And the beauty of this um, session, and I really have to give you the credit, uh, Graham, for planting the seed with us. Um, to give people uh, the choice of a rotating session so that our folks can come here, uh, listen, and listen to your presentation, and then folks who, who would like to hear but want to hear something else can then come in uh, the second rotation. So with that, I'll let you take it away, enjoy this session, and I'll be back with you towards the end. Thank you very much, Valerie. Um, and um, I just want to say, guys, uh, I'm interested in uh, interaction here. This is a smaller group, so... Uh, we can be interactive. Um, the chat is open. If you want to put questions into chat, please feel free to do so. And I'll I'll pause periodically, and we can have a have a look at the chat and and try and generate at least some level of discussion. So, um, Mary, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So, um, I'm going to show you. Um, uh, the same diagram a variety of times, really, over the course of the next 20 minutes or so. Um, the the in the first iteration what you see here is a variety of hospitals and a variety of patients um, and those in the green boxes uh, those patients in the green boxes uh, are those that have uh, traditionally been able to be recruited into clinical trial services uh, they um, uh, they live relatively speaking near the hospital uh, and are um, relatively speaking easily recruited um, however if a site is not um, taking part in a clinical trial, like the one on the bottom left here, um, those patients, of course, don't get access to, to, the, to the trial. <clears throat> Sites can really only recruit those patients who are relatively nearby. Um, what, that, what that means is we end up treating access to patients as <clears throat> um, uh, the patients get treated as assets. So um, that's not to say that the sites are not caring and treating their patients appropriately from a medical point of view, but from a commercial perspective, they're seen as assets. Um, and that is in counterpoint, if you like, to being seen as customers. Most patients can't actually take part. Um, it's, uh, we, we don't get a lot of data on this, but it's reasonable to assume that something like 70% of patients in any uh, indication are never even approached about a clinical trial, and that's even within sites that are taking part. Um, many patients can't take part uh, because the impact of the trial on the patient's life is so high. Uh, this leads to uh, slow recruitment and poor retention of patients into the trial. Site management costs are therefore very high. You need to add sites to add patients. Some sites find it very difficult to add patients, and each site can't add that many. So the traditional model is one where only a small number of patients can take part in the clinical trial. If we move on to the next slide. The um, decentralized clinical trial methodologies, however, have made a significant impact on this uh, over the years. Patients from further away can now participate in clinical trials. Now, in particular, key opinion leaders um, benefit strongly from this. Uh, they're often in tertiary referral centres, places that draw patients from a very large area, many of whom, as a consequence, can't actually take part in the clinical trials, but may be patients that are ideally suited to take part in these clinical trials. So difficult, complex, uh, refractory patients to present therapies often reside a very long way away from their tertiary care site, and that significantly changed by the introduction of of uh, decentralized methodologies. Um, if you look at the bottom uh, two uh, elements of the picture, you can see that uh, we've also got a new patient from the left now going on to a, to a hospital on the right. Um, these are what you give patients. A patient is moving, is being referred from one hospital to another, ideally, uh, and is joining another um, hospital population. Uh, again, numbers of, of patients like this are hard to hard to uh, pin down, but various numbers have been published. 30% um, of uh, largish trials are often based around these types of referral patients, uh, but it varies widely uh, trial to trial. It's also possible, of course, that with decentralized clinical trials, you end up with fewer sites 
you don't have to. Most of today's implementations uh, don't reduce the site numbers significantly because uh, by reducing site numbers, you are ultimately reducing your potential to recruit. Whereas if you just add decentralized clinical trials on top of the sites you've already got in, uh, in the trial, then you actually get potential to do significantly more. So site numbers can drop, but uh, I think in the present implement implementations, that is not that common. But what we see from this type of introduction is that patients are starting to exercise choices. Uh, we're making it easier for them to exercise those choices. And the choices they're making are, will I take part in this clinical trial? And where should I take part in this clinical trial? Which site should I be going to? And do I want to be treated in the home? Now, many of the decentralized methodologies uh, revolve around the types of services that MRN provide, uh, which is obviously why I'm here. Uh, and that is face-to-face -face, uh, clinical trial visits taking part place in the community between uh, a patient and a nurse. Uh, but there are also technologies available which allow you to collect data without a nurse being present. So that's what DCT is doing today. It's, it's driving up patient numbers. It's ex allowing patients to exercise some level of choice in the clinical and taking part in the clinical trial, making it easier for them to do so. Uh, and it has the potential to reduce total site numbers. Next, the next slide, please. But it's not all about geography. Um, other patients are also taking part, and you can see more patients ending up in the green boxes here. Um, these are patients, perhaps, from communities that are less well served by healthcare. So, around the globe, there are communities where there are it's harder to access the healthcare infrastructure. It may be patients who are less able to take time off work or school or other commitments uh, who are being seen in the home. Uh, it may be patients who have um, poor access to their own carers to transport them to sites. It may be patients who are just less able to navigate the world. Um, and here we're talking about you know, patients who may be uh, um, elderly or frail, um, patients who may have mental health issues, uh, young patients, uh, anybody who just finds getting around the world uh, that much harder. We also have patients from communities that are less likely to use healthcare infrastructure, and there are lots of reasons for this. So this is the uh, flip side, if you like, of the coin uh, from the first bullet point where there's less infrastructure available. Uh, here we're talking about communities which are often minority communities that are disadvantaged sense of perhaps immigrant communities where the cultural approach to the healthcare in the country that they're living in is different from what they are used to uh, and consequently they find it hard to access healthcare facilities. So ultimately um, this type of methodology dramatically broadens the type of patient who can take part in a clinical trial not just because of where they live but also because of um, all of their circumstances and how difficult it is to take part in a clinical trial and the impact on their life is diminished. So this is what we regard as the democratization of clinical trials. What's happening is we're making it easier for the patient to act as a stakeholder uh, and we are broadening therefore the appeal of clinical trials uh, in a broad sense to the patient population. Look at the next slide. Of course, as you move into any new paradigm, and this is quite a shift, um, there are challenges. Um, not everything is shown on this diagram because it gets a bit busy, but the nursing infrastructure in order to visit patients in their own home was fundamentally in place. Companies like the MRN have been doing this for a long time. We've been doing it for 15 years. Um, and the MRN recently hit its 50,000th clinical trial visit. So um, getting nurses to visit patients around the globe in their own home uh, is, is quite feasible in today's infrastructure. We also have had for a long time brokerage systems in place, which, which um, on the internet, um, where patients register their interest in clinical trials and sites register their interest in clinical trials and sponsors go and look for patients and sites to take part. Um, so uh, that type of technology, and indeed a lot of the technology relating to decentralization 
has been in place for some time. Um, uh, so uh, this is this is a reasonably well trodden path, but it does leave some significant elements that are not presently in place. And the first one, which I've, I've labelled these one to is to do with referral processes between hospitals. Many of you um, will have come across patient stories uh, from patient advocates in particular, uh, which are terribly painful, where you listen to patients who um, have died or have come very close to death, waiting to be referred from one site to another in order to participate in a clinical trial. These referral processes pretty much around the world are very kludgy and they are uh, very slow and they don't take um, the urgency of patients' health into account um, enough. Some of them will, of course, um, but many of them don't. And patients are seriously disadvantaged. They know where they want to go. They know where they can be seen and, and a trial can, can look after them. They just can't get there, not with their data. Uh, and that prevents them from taking part in the clinical trial. The referral processes, therefore, between hospitals uh, are a serious bottleneck to the democratisation of clinical trials, and that needs to be addressed. The next one I've ident identified is um, physicians lacking awareness of trial sites. If you look at picture two, I've actually put the number next to a little computer icon, which is the patient is using to determine is a clinical trial taking place, and am I going to... Am I going to go to site A or to site B? Um, but actually, the physician has also got a little computer icon there, and they uh, should be looking at where are the clinical trials that this patient could go into. Um, and uh, uh, it's also clear from many of the patient advocates and also the physicians we talk to that um, those physicians and uh, hospitals that are not taking part in clinical trials are often very poor at trying to identify whether there are other clinical trials that patients could be allocated to outside of that particular site. And this is one of the downsides of treating patients as an asset. Um, so this links into um, uh, clinical trials as a treatment option. Um, we need to have significant infrastructure in place for physicians so that they know what is possible and what is available to patients. Um, number three is physicians talking to each other. This is quite different from the referral processes. This is doctors um, talking to each other about patients. One of the key elements here, which I've, I've tried to um, show with a little black diamond, is the patient-physician relationship. Um, it's, a, it's, a, um, uh, it's a critical element in whether or not patients will take part in clinical trials. If their physician is not taking part in the clinical trial, um, they have to uh, sever their relationship with that physician. According to good clinical practice, the, the investigating physician in the trial has to take over all responsibility for the treatment of that condition. Uh, and that may be breaking a relationship that's been many years or even decades in the forming between a patient and their present carer, their present physician. And that's something you do very, uh, you know, you don't do lightly. It takes a lot of effort. Um, and uh, in today's medical environment, I personally see there's no reason why physicians uh, cannot be continuing to take part in the clinical trial with their patients so that they understand what is going on and are working with the other physician in the, uh, in the uh, trial site in order to give the best treatment to the patient. I don't think we should be breaking these relationships. Um, uh, and I think good clinical practice is misplaced by putting that in into its um, into its requirements. Um, and then finally, you've got resources uh, insights. Resources insights have been a problem, obviously. I say obviously, but they, they have been a problem for uh, for decades, ever since I've been in clinical trial work, which is decades. Um, the um, the problem about recruitment is usually not how many patients does the site have, but how many patients can the site see uh, with the resources it has available to take part in the clinical trial. That's often considerably lower than the total number of patients the site may have. That problem is only going to get more acute. If we have fewer sites with more patients going to them, 
they have to have better infrastructure, uh, better infrastructure to do the clinical trial, more resources to do the clinical trial, and ultimately better infrastructure to look after the care of the patient because they're taking on a huge uh, care load. And so if we do see decentralized clinical trials creating one site per country in a small country or five sites in a large country like the United States, um, those sites could be looking after not 10 patients like they do today, but 100. Uh, and that's a significant departure uh, and will make uh, significant strains on their infrastructure. There's other things, of course, that will also happen, but fundamentally, um, these, these uh, bottlenecks and other challenges still remain for the new paradigm to really um, take hold. If we go to the next slide. So this is my last slide, and then I'll have a look at some of the questions and we can, um, we can start some debate. Uh, what I've said really is that um, patients are fundamentally treated as assets today when it comes to a sort of commercial view. Uh, but this paradigm is already cracked open. Decentralized clinical trials are here uh, and they're growing fast. Uh, Community-based trial activities uh, should have three key stakeholders and the patient needs to be um, pushed up the stakeholder hierarchy. We need sponsors, sites and patients all to be treated as, as stakeholders and give us a, a true win-win-win environment for all of them. Sponsors will get more, uh, more patients in their clinical trials faster and retain them more. Sites will get more patients treated with trial medication as they need it, and patients will have more choices and will be able to take part and get access to IMP. Um, not only will it be patients who live further away, but it'll also be patients who come from all the different types of society that we have, giving us a much broader base of patient in clinical trials. This is true patient centricity. It's amplifying the position of patients in the stakeholder hierarchy. But there are changes which still remain, challenges rather, that still remain. Information about trials uh, to patients and physicians, site resourcing, models of shared care, uh, referral systems, etc. But the train has left the station. There's no stopping it now. This is all going to happen, but it'll take time for these challenges to be addressed. OK, so those, that's the end of the presentation. Um, we've got a few minutes left, so I will look at the chat, uh, if I may. Um, Renata, do you see any issue in DCT creating competition between the sites, fear of losing patients to that of other hospitals? Um, I think there are financial issues that get raised by sites, especially in uh, the US, in fact, where there are many more um, uh, sites as businesses rather than uh, the rest of the world. And so there are issues. Um, but ultimately, most physicians are, are motivated by doing the right thing for their patient. Um, so uh, although this is a resistance, uh, I don't think it's as powerful as you as we might think. Um, uh, Carol, would you be able to present this to patient communities? We're always interested in talking to patient communities. So yes, absolutely. Uh, Howard, the site hub and spoke model with main hospital coordinating activities at regional centres seems a good way of bringing the trial to the patient. Um, however, like you mentioned, there are significant challenges in doing this on a large scale, and it requires a lot of time and infrastructure. That's absolutely right, Howard. It's um, it, it is, uh, in large degree, decentralized clinical trials are an extension of the original site hub and spoke model, which you know, we've worked with for 30 or 40 years, um, digitizing that model and, um, and taking it out into uh, the next layer of complexity, taking the trial right into the patient's home. Um, so, Renato, yes, you're following up on that conversation. Um, uh, yes, you will find it's differently. People will accept it in different layers. And, and uh, we also find that different countries approach things in different ways, different sites in, uh, approach things in different ways. There are different challenges in setting up these types of trials. I think the, the, the key element, first and foremost, is this is not about perfection. Um, you don't need every site to collaborate this way. You don't need every site to take part. Um, but if you have a, a majority of your sites, you will recruit much faster and you will reach more patients. So it's not a game of perfect. 
Um, it's a game of getting better. Uh, yeah, and are there ways of getting lab tests done closer to home? Well, there are. Um, that's not an MRN um, service particularly, but there are uh, uh, laboratory services which are much more distributed, uh, especially in the United States, but it also actually does occur in other countries. For instance, um, uh, the laboratory system in India uh, is, uh, when I last looked, and we don't do a lot of work in India, um, in fact, MRN doesn't do uh, any work in India, but we looked at it very carefully at the time, and it was the only uh, national infrastructure in India was the sample and laboratory infrastructure. Uh, so yes, um, there are, there are um, elements of that in place, uh, and I'm sure it will grow. So Maria, um, can DCT have an impact in safety reporting? Uh, if yes, how can we overcome such issues? Um, I haven't seen any impact on uh, safety reporting uh, Maria, I think um, uh, our system is is very robust for safety reporting. It has multiple backups um, and uh, works works well. So I don't see safety as an issue. Uh, certainly not in terms of clinical trial safety and serious adverse event reporting and and data collection. Um, I think um, there are some safety issues. You know we. Uh, uh, certainly at the MRN, you know, we are a care organisation. We organise nurses to look after patients in their homes, uh, as well as other things. And um, that means that there are certain things that we won't do in the home. And those types of considerations do have to be uh, carefully discussed with sponsors so that we don't do things that are putting patients at risk. Um, but actually, uh, the vast majority of clinical trials are done in relatively health, you know, uh, chronically ill but stable patients, and that is not a significant issue uh, as long as it's um, carefully managed. Howard, okay, uh, I find the main challenge I've come across when discussing innovation and DCT activities accompanying a study is a site fear of losing control. I feel this is a big blocker to these activities. The sites are focused less on the patient and what is best for them, and more on a fear of losing control to all aspects of their journey. I think control is important, it's very important. And um, when you're looking at providers like us, you have, to, you have to think about how they are inserting the nurse into the relationship that the site has with its patient. Um, and where you're talking about rare disease, uh, pediatric conditions, the relationship between the patient and the site is often very strong. And putting a third party in there can be quite difficult. Um, so you need to make sure that that nurse is um, is uh, reviewed fundamentally by the PI and the site coordinator that they feel that they are taking someone into their team and that they have the ability to help that person do what it is they want them to do in the home uh, and work with them as part of the team uh, rather than um, any of the control of that patient passing over to some other entity. You know, we don't take control of any of our patients from that point of view. Uh, and the processes that we follow ensure that the nurses talk to the study coordinators and the PIs as regularly as we can in order to, um, to ensure that the nurse is seen as a member of the team. 